Welcome to the Werewolf Den, where we delve into gaming concepts behind White Wolf's Werewolf the Apocalypse. I'm Amelin. And I'm Ryan. Welcome back. So, last time we talked about the arguably most urban of all of the tribes. This time we're going to talk about which is basically the polar opposite of that. The tribe that does not even allow human-born into it. The Red Talons. Mm -hmm. So the Red Talons, to sum it up succinctly, are the tribe of wolves. And with a lot of the previous tribes, we've sort of mentioned how there's a stereotype associated with them, and there's here are some ways to think about it that sort of break from that stereotype or move away from it a bit to give you more room to think. The Red Talons are a tribe where that stereotype is kind of important to understand. And the common stereotype for the Red Talons is... Kill a, all humans! Yes, all humans must die. That the state of wolves in the world, the state of the world itself, all of its ailments and issues, it, it all stems from humanity. And so their sort of knee-jerk reaction is kill all humans. And I don't want to say abandon that stereotype because it is a vital concept to the tribe, to everything that they have had to endure, everything that's happened to Gaia and the wild and to wolves in general can all be associated back to humans. And to, to sort of say don't have that philosophy really undermines the tribe. The issue is that a lot of games don't have a place for that style of red talent. If you're playing in an urban setting, then having the instinct to just kill every human you come across is going to lead to a game of nothing but... And here's... Oh, we're rolling initiative. Here's something else. Roll some more initiative. It's either the ultimate murder hobo, mm -hmm. or... The ultimate, well, I guess I'm rolling up a new character this week sort of deal. Yeah. The thing is, this is by far the most intimidating tribe to play. And because of that, we've talked before about how other tribes like Black Furies are not popular, but you'll still occasionally get someone willing to play a Black Fury, maybe like once every three games that you run into. Red Talons are so intimidating that you'll be lucky to end the LARP you ran when we had the most players possible was like 30. In that entirety of that run, over multiple years, we had a single Red Talon. I think we had two. One was a, a killmeister, though. The player just went to LARPs to kill things. And so Red Talon was, frankly, a perfect fit for him. But I think even a lot of, you know, very confrontational players still understand that there's probably not room for a Red Talon, even in a large-scale LARP. One of the big things is, is that when you have a tribe that... It's one thing for a Black Fury to shun all potential cis male players out of the tribe, because that has some human interactions that can be built off of. And being feminist in that way doesn't exclude male players from associating with that person. Mm -hmm. Being a red talon, if played to a hard enough extreme, can have that effect. It makes it very difficult to build positive relationships. And honestly, that feels like it's the biggest hurdle to overcome with the Red Talons, is having that outlook, that outreach, that possibility of a positive relationship with your fellow players. So that's one of the things we're hoping to address with this, because it is a very cool tribe, and is one of those tribes that's kind of essential to Werewolf itself. The, the entire stack of cards would sort of fall apart without the Red Talons. So understanding the tribe and finding ways to play the tribe that can work well in multiple different scenarios, aside from, you know, where here in the middle of a forest and there are no people around, red talons can probably slide. Now, let's look for some more ways that we can adapt the tribe to fit within even your general standard mark. Or even your standard tabletop setting, because you're going to have Hamids playing with you in your tabletop as well, and you need to learn to get along with them. So one of the big things that 
I feel like we should definitely consider when it comes to playing a red talon is the concept of nowadays in a lot of regions of the world, wolves have been taken off of the endangered species list. There's definitely still places that need to be improved upon. There's definitely still protections that need to be put up. There's definitely places where they got taken off too early, easily. But their populations are growing, and I think White Wolf would do well to address this and actually encompass it. Because one of the big things with making Red Talons hard to play is when this was originally thought of, it was thought of under the notion that wolves are endangered. They are going extinct. And it made the Red Talon stance so much more understandable to the average player. We are going extinct. People, humans, are hunting and killing us. And there's definitely still room for that. For all the people that want to, like, play Red Talon to seek vengeance on Sarah Palin, by all means, do that. But when you have a population that's growing, then you have a potential for the notion of a Red Talon victory. This notion that perhaps you can introduce into your story the idea that the Red Talons have been working with the other tribes. The other tribes see the value in preserving wolves, if for nothing else, for kinfolk stock. But there is value in werewolf society. So bringing in this notion that wolves' population are growing, are changing, broadens the horizons, then, for what the Red Talons can do. It goes from just nothing but instinctual self-defense against systemic issues to notions of being a second-class citizen within a society that supposedly reveres both halves of what a werewolf is. And even that condition that, you know, wolf populations are rising can still inform a red talent perspective in a very interesting way. Because, like you mentioned, if the population's in decline and there's the threat of extinction, then yes, you're absolutely back to the wall, like, fighting to just survive. But if the population is growing, there's still the question of why is it growing? Well, because you know, there are these select reservations where wolf populations are maintained and shepherded by, you know, forest rangers and, you know, government officials and things of that sort, tracking tags and, and all of that. So there's still this concern that the wolf is still being lost. And I think you can make that argument as a red talon that, you know, just because wolf populations are on the incline in, you know, Yellowstone National Park doesn't mean that everything's hunky dory. There's still a lot of fight left to do. But that fight has now changed. Instead of being that back to the wall, like, I just need to make it to tomorrow and keep surviving, now it's a matter of, all right, what is survival going to look like from here on out? Where are the wild, feral wolf populations at? And things of that sort. And yeah, I think that opens up a lot of new avenues, especially for interaction with other tribes, in trying to, you know, find these new avenues, these new opportunities, because... The fight is still on, but it's it's not quite as dire as it was, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's that whole situation of just because three of my brothers that would have died are now surviving to a reasonable age doesn't necessarily mean that they're living good lives mm -hmm. sort of deal. And this kind of brings into an issue that really should be more of a Red Talon thing, and more players, we feel, really should embrace this aspect with Red Talons, particularly when it comes to creating good politics and good interaction. Well, good in a role-play sense, we should say, with other players, and that is the aspect of kinfolk, lupus kinfolk, to be specific. In the LARP that Ryan ran... We had a player who played a Silver Fang, and the Silver Fang had the most gorgeous and elegant and magnificent wolf kinfolk on his sheet, basically. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting here like, I exist as a Silver Fang to breed and create the ultimate wolf. 
And very frequently, he went up to this female wolf, a normal kinfolk wolf, as a hispo, and said he was breeding with her. Yeah, it got weird. To boot, he's a homid, you know, and the player is human, you know. He had taken the flaw mark of the predator, which literally means that animals don't like you. You are barred from having animal kin. You can't even relate to them. So he's this alien entity, right, with no animalistic side that he can portray, who shows up and turns into this dire monster wolf. And, you know, he, he, he doesn't understand how mating works. He literally can't. He took this flaw. So he's, you know, essentially raping this kinfolk. And, you know, a lot of people, when they have that background dot, they don't think of these as actual people. They're resources, right? And I think wolf kinfolk suffer from that more than anything else, because at least you're human, right? You can understand what your human kinfolk might be thinking. But this wolf kinfolk, well, that's just a pet. It's a, it's a resource. It doesn't have ambitions or dreams or desires, things like that. It's just a wolf, so therefore I can justify, so long as I feed and groom and take care of it like I would a dog, Mm -hmm. it's fine. And I remember in this particular LARP, I was a player, and my Black Fury player had something to say about all this. He came to my character and was like, I'm having issues with my one of my female kinfolk, and I was hoping that you could tell me what's going on. And I communed with this kinfolk and looked at him and was like, she's terrified of you. She hates and is terrified of you. And he's like, well, what can you do about that? Nothing. She's terrified of you. Stop it. Mm -hmm. And this can definitely be a thing that a red talon can get in on. Because we brought this specific, very specific story up, in part because it amuses us, but inevitably... It's kind of a very common thing amongst players. Mm -hmm. If it's a dot on your sheet, it's a resource. And if it's a resource or a skill or whatever for you to tap into, then it's less likely to be a person. And thankfully, White Wolf has kind of capitalized on this a bit with that notion. They did it with Vampire with Ghouls, where it's like, your ghouls are second-class citizen. They do it with Werewolf, where they're like, your kinfolk. They're second-class citizens in Garu society. But at the very least, a smart player sits down and realizes with human kinfolk, oh, if I have a good storyteller, they're going to treat these kinfolk like people. But they don't make that assertion with the lupus as well, with the wolf kinfolk. And this can definitely be something that you can really drive into as a red talon, is this notion of elevating lupus kinfolk. Elevating them in their role in Garu society, because kinfolk do have a role. It's one of the most awesome books in the entire system on mm. some heroes. Yep. Wolf kinfolk can have that same potential. You just need to be a little bit more creative, perhaps, with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so kinfolk are definitely treated as, you know, these resources. Uh, none more so than lupus because of the rarity These are status symbols, in a sense, to have. And yet, yeah, they're viewed as not even really sentient or aware as characters. You know, they're just resources. But another way to sort of interact with kinfolk is to consider where your lupus comes from. With homids, it's very easy, right? Homids are all over the place. Lupus, not so much. And in places where wolves are, again, these are largely highly regulated areas where there are forest and park rangers who are responsible for tracking and maintaining the population, tagging them, checking them for any diseases or parasites, keeping them healthy and stable. They're very micromanaged. There are very, very few places in the world where wolves are just allowed to be feral because they're a danger to livestock, occasionally to humans. You know, these are not populations that are allowed to just be free and wild. And so when considering where your lupus comes from, I think it's important to keep in mind kinfolk. Another one of the bad stories from when I first started playing werewolf, and I'm guilty of this myself, was it was very, very common for non-homids and non-metis to be born in zoos. Because as, you know, an, an ignorant player just stepping into the system, it seems like, oh, yeah, there are wolves in zoos, right? Sure, this works. Oh, oh boy. 
Yeah, unless there is a Garu or Kinfolk managing that zoo, not a good place, right? Chances are, as a Lupus born, there was a Garu or a Kinfolk somewhere within your immediate circle. Someone overseeing that property or reservation, someone overseeing that uh, zoo, you know, what have you. There is someone connected to the Garu Nation involved in your immediate birth. And so, much like Metis, who are, you know, born into Garu society, Lupus are very much so as well. I would say almost as much, because, again, feral wolf populations are exceedingly... And so using this as a way to strengthen that consideration of kinfolk, in that, you know, you were born a kinfolk, of course, uh, your parents were kinfolk, things of that sort, you weren't just one of these lost cubs who popped up out of nowhere, that gives you a, a strong angle to play with there, and also gives you the opportunity to come into this as a character aware of the nation itself, right? That you're not just a wolf straight out of, you know, some isolated forest, you haven't seen a human for your entire life kind of thing. No, you're inculcated in this culture and this society, so it allows you to sort of flex your muscles, right, in interacting within that community and not being sort of this outcast or alone. So, I feel like we've more or less covered... Hopefully giving you some good ideas for what to avoid and how best to maybe build up good person-to-person interactions as a Red Talon using the notions of human population density versus wolf population. What's the word I'm looking for? Not density, but freedom, I suppose. The freedom of the local wolf population. Bringing up this notion of perhaps introducing that wolves are on the rise. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the more esoteric aspects of the Red Talons. Because if you're going to get esoteric with really any of the tribes, it's probably going to be this one. We'll start with Red Talon history. And White Wolf did, I feel, when I went back recently and reread the Red Talon book. I was super impressed with how Red Talon history was written up to a point. The early prehistory stuff is great. When you read the notions of how Red Talons consider the world to have been born, it's probably my favorite story of how that came along. They had this notion of the wild being like, the existence of all the plants in the world, and the worm is the entity of the sky and the wind, and the weaver is the entity of the earth and the ground. And you have this old story about how the wild doesn't care, and the wild is just growing everywhere and invading the worm's sky with its super tall trees and covering the weaver's ground with all of its plants. And it's very mystifying. And it still very much hits that whole worm weaver wild, but in a very different way. And it continues with this whole notion. When you get into why red talons think, according to early human populations, why human populations are tainted, it's this notion that humans are supposed to be prey, but the worm came and tricked them into thinking that they were predators, and so it screwed up the hierarchy of beings within Gaia's wild setting. And it's very interesting. I definitely recommend reading. But then it starts to fall apart as you start getting into history that we know. There's an entire section of Red Talon history where Red Talons just don't exist. They just disappeared and just didn't come back for a while. And this is definitely something where I feel like White Wolf could definitely improve upon. And one of the ways that they could improve upon this is actually through something that they did introduce. And we could have talked about this notion with some of the other tribes, particularly when, how, with how much we talk about diversity amongst the tribes. But I feel like this is probably the best place to start talking about this. I looked it up, but I swear I probably will butcher this. There is something that is, I guess, the vampire equivalent of a bloodline or something like that within the Red Talons. 
called the Kucha Ukunda. These are red talons that exist in Africa. And they are red talons that are just African wild dogs because wolves, they're not a thing in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I love it when White Wolf does this. One, it touches on one of the biggest things that bothers me with the pharaoh, but it does imply that whole notion of the tribes are bigger than their initial European branded concepts. Mm -hmm. The Kucha Kunda are red talons that are African wild dogs, and they do their red talon thing, but in Africa. And because of that, that cultural distinction has a lot of differences that can really work with it. And one of the biggest reasons I like it is because, I'll go ahead and put this out now, I like the idea of the pharaoh. I hate how they're executed. I hate it. The notion of shape-shifting cats and sharks and all of that, cool notion. White Wolf did a terrible job in executing it. Why the fuck does anybody want to be a Korax? Seriously. Why does anybody want to be a Korax? And it is so unnecessary. A lot of them overlap. You've got silent striders to act as messengers, but now here's the Korak. You've got Ragabash to be tricksters, but now here's the Nuisha. There's just a lot of, why is this here? Why don't they have a, a niche of their own? Why are they just overlapping with other Garu? Just, just be Garu. Mm hmm And I feel like with the Kucha Kunda, this is a good spot to kind of play with this. Something that I would really love to do, but I just, with the games I played, I haven't gotten a chance to run this, is introduce the notion that tribes exist amongst the pharaoh and their standard werewolf tribes, it's just with their own cultural flavor. Because that's one of the big things that I kind of hate about the pharaoh. The closest thing they have to the equivalency of tribes is the bastet with the different types of big cat that they could be. And that doesn't work. And it gives this globalness to the notion of the fight for Gaia. Mm -hmm. Gaia is not going to sit there and look at South America and be like, well, there's, I guess I'm just not going to have anybody fight for me here in South America. It's just not necessary. No, Gaia is going to look at South America and be like, oh, that panther, that's going to do the same thing as a Gru. But, you know, as a panther. And I like this notion of then broadening them out. And you can come across this with the Kucha Akunda of the Red Talons, and you can come across this when we get into the extinct tribes with the Bunya. It's an entire tribe that's not wolf, but somehow they're still considered Garu. Yep. And it just pokes that hole of how unnecessary that is. And playing with that line between what is Garu and what is Farah is an excellent notion, I think, for the Red Talons to play with. Because the Red Talons exist in this whole immersion of kind of almost shunning their human side. So then how do they interact with other Pharah? How do they treat other Pharah? Because in the War of Rage, their book describes them as, Oh, uh, well, we punched them because these guys told us to. And that's kind of what it amounts to. But, yeah. That's kind of one of the big things. I really feel like this notion of playing with other Farah is an excellent thing to really broach when it comes to the Red Talons. And particularly with the whole notion of, once again, keep in mind, werewolf society is an oral society. This means that not everything that is being told is true. Mm -hmm. Stories change. Games of telephone never result in the same message. So, between generations, these stories are shifting. They're being molded by the people who tell them. The Silver Record is outstanding because it's written down. Mm -hmm. There's very little written history with the guard. But with that, we also do need to touch, since we have been talking about Garu history, the biggest thing that the Red Talons are known for, which is the Impergium. So, the Impergium. I'll let you discuss it, because I've been talking a whole lot sure, <laughs> this whole fine. thing. <laughs> so the Impergium is essentially when the Garu decided that humanity was going to be a problem, and so started keeping the populations in check. The actual timetable on this I've never seen, you know, written out and codified, because again, oral history, right? But it's always pre-historic. 
It is prior to the emergence of settlements and civilization. So before 10,000 BCE, within that wheelhouse. But it's at this time that the Garu started, you know, treating human populations the way human populations kind of treat wolf populations nowadays, where they're kept in check, they're cordoned off, they're, you know, killed off if the population gets too high because we don't want destability within the ecosystem, things of that sort. The Impergium is where the condition of the delirium comes from, where when non-kinfolk see a Garu in one of their war forms, it triggers those ancestral responses to when they were being hunted and killed, often for sport, and so they freak out. So the Impergium, obviously, has a very strong root with the Red Talons, and there are a lot of Red Talons that say that it never should have ended, that we should bring it back, things of that sort. So, on top of that, like, they even have this long-standing history when it comes to the Impergium that, in their minds, the vote to end the Impergium was supposed to be unanimous, but the rest of the tribes didn't consider them a tribe. And when they voted to say, hey, we don't want this to end, this is going to end badly, the other tribes are like, who are you? And they just went up and raked... Uh, this that glyph that you see on that book on in front of your book that's in front of pretty much all the core books that have come out that's the red talon glyph and this kind of just tells you how intrinsic they are to garu society but at the same time they are just so forgotten for something so essential that their glyph is the default glyph for all of the entirety of the book mm-hmm they are strangely absent in the game. Yeah. Another example of this sort of erasure is with the Prophecy of the Phoenix. So within the meta plot, Prophecy of the Phoenix, you can find it pretty much at the beginning of every werewolf book within their you know little story comic that they introduce. Very, very prolific. But it basically you know foretells the end time, that there will come this day when you know Gaia is choked out with, with putrid smoke and... And life is born not in the womb, but in test tubes or in, you know, glass cages. All of this doom and gloom. Yeah, all of this corruption. But this prophecy, told by Phoenix, was given to a Red Talon Thayer. And I think that's another important thing to sort of consider, is that from Phoenix's perspective here, if you're going to give this information to someone so that they can do something about it, Phoenix's solution was give it to the Red Talon. Because they're the ones who have the clarity and the insight and the power to enact change to stop this prophecy. from. And that's a really big thing when you actually consider it. And so frequently the Red Talons get shunned because players don't want to play the murderous, psychopathic Red Talon. But then consider the fact that there's the concept that the Red Talons may be right. The spirits are indicating this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they are not you know, alone on an island with their thoughts. And it's not just their totem, it's other spirits that feel them. That, yeah, the call to action needs to go to them, because they'll do something about it. And I think that's very powerful. And so not having any Red Talon presence in your game, that loses something for the game as a whole. You're, you're losing that, the soul, the heart and soul of Garou. So one of the big things that you definitely also can do when you consider this is play a Red Talon Galliard. And as a Red Talon Galliard, consider the notion that all of the words that are used in Garu are Celtic words. They're human words. Yeah. That your your culture, in essence, has been erased. That it's, it's, it's humankind. That, you know, this community, this society that's supposed to be half human, half wolf, is so heavily human. There are weird trappings, like howls and things of that sort, but by and large, it's it's entirely human-based. And again, yes, this game was developed by humans. Obviously, that's going to happen, but I think it's an interesting way to play your character in that sense. That, as a Galliard, you're trying to reestablish the wolf aspect within Garu culture. And I think there's a lot of room to play there. And again, none of it has to do with killing every human you come across. It's an awesome way to interact in a new avenue of life. Cool aspect to maybe approach this with, with the Red Talons. Consider the fact that wolves 
don't actually exist on this alpha beta mentality that exists within Garu society. Mm -hmm. That is a human construct that gets attributed to wolves, yeah, but because of captive wolves, yeah, and, and you can do this with all the auspices. I think the auspice is a great way to sort of consider new ways to look at it. If you're an Arun, as a wolf, you're accustomed to the pack working as a whole, right? And so you can be an Arun that works to sort of coordinate and basically kind of do the Child of Gaia thing, right? Mm -hmm. Of get everyone working on the same measure. And I think that, yeah, if you go back to what we talked about previously, right? That Phoenix saw the tribe as being the ones who would act with this information. Yeah, pull that cloud up. When the Silver Fang comes up and goes, we should be in charge because of breed, then go, well, Phoenix said that we're the ones to handle this, and I'm going to bring everyone together. And all of the players who just hate the Silver Fangs because they're the in-charge ones will rally to your flag. Oh, that's another cool concept. Yeah, there's great ways to sort of consider, especially how to build networks and relationships with other players and NPCs as a red talent because you don't just want to be the batman who's sitting there by himself soaking brooding complaining about humans killing everyone you come across and not have any positive or even interesting dynamic relationships with other players that sort of thing. Yeah. entrench this notion into you that your pack in wolf society pack is family literally mm -hmm. the quote-unquote alpha beta are your parents yep so feel free, honestly, like whenever I almost, almost every time, whenever I introduce a red talent, they have a sibling that's also a guru because that's how entrenched it is as one of the games I'm running right now. There is a lupus pairing, one's child of Gaia, one's red talent, they're siblings, they're from the same litter and the red talent sticks with his brother because he has that loyalty to him. It is a great tribe for having a literal family dynamic with. Mm -hmm. And it's a tribe that can interact very, very well with a lot of other tribes, especially those that are based upon, you know, human socioeconomic conditions. Black Furies are upset about the patriarchy. That's a human thing. It's such a human thing that they ascribed it to wolves when it doesn't exist. And so the Red Talon and the Black Fury have great dynamics right? Bonars, same thing. They're obviously dealing with human issues. Capitalism human is issues. a human construct. You do not suffer under capitalism if you are a wolf. Like, mm -hmm. not, uh, well, you do, but in the same way that Red Talons are pissy about. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And while I don't necessarily recommend it, I think an interesting counterpoint with the Red Talons could be that if you're looking at this from, like, a purely ecological perspective, sort of a Darwinian-esque mentality, humans have conquered stuff. They are apex predators, if you will. They've been able to outdo the wolves at every turn. And, yeah, you could look at this and say, you know, the worm is definitely had a part to play in this house. But you could be the Red Talon that gives credit where credit is due and goes, all right, yeah, humans have, have beaten wolves, clearly. It's gotten to that point. But I'm a wolf and I don't want to get beat. So how can I adapt? Not perhaps as strongly as, say, a glasswalker would, but how can I incorporate some of my enemy's tools to further my own survival, to keep this fight and maybe turn the tides? There's a... NPC in one of the books, I believe it was one of the older versions of the Red Tide, that is a drug dealer, and he exists to create the most natural, poisonous drugs <laughs> he possibly can, and he sells them to humans to get by, but then he gives credit where credit is due if the human has built up a strong enough tolerance to survive his drug. And it's an interesting concept to work with, mm -hmm. is this notion of maybe the thing wrong with the humans is the fact that they coddle each other too much, or that there's not a, a predator for them, or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are interesting ways, like you said, to sort of express that red talon urge that we talked about at the very beginning, right? 
without just being kill everything on set. Mm-hmm. How how can you how can you express that desire to get revenge without just being a, a murderous man? All right. And with that, I think we've pretty much covered, for the most part, everything that we wanted to cover. Mm-hmm. We definitely went a lot longer than we have in previous episodes. We were actually originally a little scared that we weren't going to have enough to say about Red Tones. Apparently, we have more to say about them than any other tribe. Yeah, but there's a lot of questions to be raised and, and interesting approaches to take. So, we'll go ahead and let you ruminate on that for now. And next time, we'll be talking about another really cool tribe. But also another one that doesn't get played a whole lot, the Silent Strikers. So, we'll see you then.